All right, let's just open in prayer. All right, well, Father, we just thank you for this evening. Lord, we just thank you for the transition that we are experiencing in the physical and the spiritual here in this body, in this building, in this uh, city, in our own lives, Lord, that you are outpouring and outdoing us, that you're just blessing us abundantly. And Lord, as we take this step of faith and, and start Wednesday nights in, in a training facility, Lord, in that, at, in that attitude, in an atmosphere, we just bless you. Thank you for open ears, open hearts, and our spirits are awake and quickened. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, you know, I, I know that, uh, that we have wonderful times on Sunday morning, and that is about teaching lifestyle. Wednesday nights, uh, with what the Lord spoke apostolically through Tom here a couple weeks ago, is uh, really hammered home the need for our Wednesday nights training. And what we're going to be doing over the next, I don't know how long it'll be, it could be a good while, it may continue just because of this subject matter and the revel- relevance of it being released in this area is uh, the apostolic movement. Um, as you can see, I just want to quickly just kind of share with you what happened this week. Um, as we were doing the wedding and we moved the things around to make sure we had an aisle for the bride and the groom and everybody to come down, the Lord said, you know, you were concerned about moving that wall and you kept butting your head against it because it wasn't going to move. And I said, yeah, absolutely. What's the story? So as we, as I sat back there in my office with the the chairs the way we had them for the wedding, the Lord says, this is, remember the number I gave you? I said, yes. He said, you could not fulfill that number with the other chairs you had the way it was faced. I said, right. That's why I was very frustrated. I knew that I thought the only way we could do this is blow the wall out. And he said, now can you see what my, what I wanted you to do? I said, yeah, I do. So I'm cool with that. I said, I I know when I'm mistaken and I'll be the first to to admit to that. So as you can see, uh, we've changed the sanctuary we have now 86 chairs up, and we still have room for more. And there's uh, room up here for ministry, for dancing, because the Lord has said that there's going to be a company of dancers being brought to this house to facilitate worship. And we're praying them in, and we're training up the next generation. Uh, there are specific people that I feel that are gifted for that. And uh, I cannot wait, and I don't believe the Spirit can wait to have that happening and be birthed here. Um, so in the natural realm and the spiritual realm, we have made a tremendous shift. Um, after the wedding, Patty and I and some others, we, uh, Carol and some other folks came in here. We tore this place down to the bare bones, down to the walls, and uh, physically a few of us moved these things around. Uh, I don't remember what days what happened because it's all a blur at this point because I was up uh, unbelievable amount of hours with my wonderful Wonder Woman wife and her Superman and some friends, we move things. So as you can see, the, the light bar has been moved from that wall. The sound booth has been narrowed to there. The entire uh, worship team has been repositioned, uh, and a lot of things have happened. And the natural thing you see here is just as dramatic as the spiritual shift that happened in this house this last two weeks. So with that all being said, I want to just let you know this teaching we're stepping into is going to be spiritually dynamic in your life and the understanding. Um, I've been studying apostolic movement, the, ap- the works of the fivefold ministry for many years, from back in the 90s. Um, I had many privileges of meeting some very powerful. They are now apostles in our nation and other nations as well. Uh, I, God just positioned me to run into them. Uh, some of the things that I've read in the, in the past years are uh, Bill Hammond's book, Ap- Apostles, Prophets, and the Coming Moves of God. Uh, Apostles, Apostolic People and Churches by Robert Munyen. Um, P- C. Peter Wagner, Apostles of the City. Noel Woodruff, Governmental Prayer, uh, The War for Expression of the Apostolic. And then there's a, another gentleman, uh, Jonathan David. He, these are all outside of this country gentlemen that I have ran into and have read their books. And... Uh, it stirred stuff in me long ago, back in the 90s. And this is what the chewing and, re- and waiting upon the Lord has come to tonight for me to release the things that I have learned to prepare us for what we are, Cornerstone Christian Fellowship. 
as you have seen, as we proclaim, as we're speaking into existence, we're in a rising apostolic church who are now stepping into our inheritance. And our inheritance is the blessing that's in this house that was set aside and reserved for us for this moment in time. Pastor Randy Domain and many of his intercessors uh, bombarded this place, dug trenches, released heaven, and gave us an incredible blessing to step into. And that is our inheritance, and we will uh, guard it and nurture it and watch it impact us as we embrace it fully in the Spirit. Um, What I've been doing with the the ministry leadership team, those are the, the ministries here, I've been very slowly kind of getting them information and getting them prepared to step in to an apostolic shift. What that entails is it goes from the pastor leading church where a pastor runs the show to an apostolic five-fold ministry shift where there is a, and, uh, there's a team that works diligently together with a set man. And that's the, the model that I've been uh, released to set up here. Um, with that being said, we're, ch- we're stepping into some pretty powerful things. We've got great leadership, ministry leaders in his house. Uh, God's adding more, as you see tonight. We have our first youth meeting. We're praying that, the, that it catches fire and that the youth will be interested and step into that. That's, that's in God's hands. It's not for us to beat our drum. Um, some of the things that I've, I've been really pressing for the Lord is an understanding of the apostolic. If you could bring up the, let me just get it out here. I'll let you know what it is, hon. The thing that's really been heavy upon my heart is we've seen many people that have come along and said, well, I'm apostle, I'm bishop, I'm this, that, and the other thing. And and the tragedy of that is that they've placed themselves with definitions that are not always biblically based. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. If you could bring that up, dear. Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll start in verse 9. And I'm just going to hit this real briefly tonight. Uh, I'm not going to go really in depth. If you need... Oh, hi, Pastor Jim. If you need notebooks, the bottom shelf of that, that bookshelf over there, there are notebooks. You can grab one. They've been used, well used, but you know what? There's still pages in there. So if you need to take notes, help yourself to a notebook. I brought them from home and threw them in there just for that purpose. Um, this is something you're going to take, take notes with and really impact and, and really read over this because this is a very uh, timely thing. Um, God's been speaking to me for some time about a new breed. Hope you don't mind, I got my shoes off because it feels nice up here. God is building and releasing a new breed of people upon the earth. And if, I, if I'm firing over your heads, just raise your hand because I want you to understand. I'm trying to get this. It's a very ethereal kind of understanding of what this really is coming upon the earth, the apostolic movement. So I want to try to get it down to where it's very palatable, it's a graspable and embraceable understanding. So the new breed that God is making, is it, it's the fullness of the five-fold ministry. We've seen the pastor, we've seen the evangelist, we've seen the prophet come in recently, we've seen teachers for years. The, apost- the apostle himself being positioned is the thing that's been kind of in the birth canal for some time. I'll put it like that. Mm, Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9. There we go. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean, but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens, that he might might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, I'm going to stop right there. Jesus himself gives the fivefold ministry. When he gives us the fivefold ministry, 
They are a gift to the church. I'm going to say that again because this is critical understanding of what the fivefold ministry is. This is the thing that sets my hackles up on my neck. They are a gift to the church. What has happened in the church when the fivefold started to come about was that men that were called by God into the fivefold forgot that they are a gift. They've taken this, the calling on their lives of the fivefold, and they've taken that as removed the gift and said, this is a structure of power. That, that makes my hackles go up. Because you do not take a gift from God and make it a power struggle or a lordly thing to be done over the church. The fivefold ministry is a gift to the church. And the first time that a man of God in the fivefold ministry forgets that they are a gift, they've disqualified themselves and tainted the gift. Now, I'm very stern about that because this is critical for us as individuals. Those that are pressing into a fivefold ministry apostolic movement in this region to never forget, never forget that we are a gift. The first time that pride rises up, it has to be circumcised off. And that is my heart first. And I lay my heart before the Lord every time I even mention the apostolic movement because I never want to forget that that it is as the part of the part that I play is a gift to the church. And I am not on a power struggle. I am not an authoritative structure man. I am a gift to the church. And that's what keeps humility in the bottom line of this. That's why I don't like titles, because titles in the normal realm sets up a power structure. And I, that is not what we're called to do as the fivefold ministry. It is a gift. And what does that gift do? Verse 12 says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. That's number one, to equip you folks. We are a gift. The fivefold ministry is a gift to you to equip you, to nurture you, to love you, to draw from you the gifts and callings in your life. Not out of authority and like that. It's, it's a coaxing. The fivefold, even the apostolic. You listen, you read what Paul said. What would Paul do in his letters most of the time? He'd love them. Then he'd go, bad, but then he'd love them again. See, he would draw with love on both ends. Do the correction and adjustment. That is the heart of the apostolic movement in its purity. It loves, corrects, adjusts, and loves some more to reinforce the equipping of the saints, to set them in their best positioning to be victorious with what their callings are. Mm. I'm trying to be good. I really am. Because when I see the church trodden underfoot by what some call the fivefold ministry, it breaks my heart. It breaks the heart of Jesus who's sent the gift. Can you see Jesus going, this is the best thing I can give the church, fivefold ministry, Holy Spirit, bam! And then it goes, tramps on him. And he's going, no, it's not why I sent you. You're a gift. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. The ministry doesn't rest upon us, the fivefold ministry. It rests upon you. It rests upon the depth of who you are in Christ. It rests upon you as we draw with the, the direction of the Holy Spirit to draw the goodness of the working of God inside of you out for the ministry's work. Not to make my ministry work. Not to make another church's ministry work. It's to make the ministry of Christ work. Understand? And that's the beauty of this. That is how the body of Christ, the church of Redmond, can function. It will function when it steps into the understanding that the fivefold ministry is set in the church as a gift 
to work the ministry of the gospel in a city and a region and a territory and for the edifying of the body of Christ. We are all, this is our family. This is our part of the body. This is our part of the Redmond Church. There is an angel, I believe, that was sent to the Redmond Church. When you read Revelation, you see that there was the angel for the church of this and this one. They all had angels. And I believe that the city of Redmond has an angel. And I believe that he has the understanding and he has a position and authority and a mission to help the body of Christ, the church of Redmond, fulfill the work of the ministry in this city. And the reason why, ooh, glory. Okay, I'm getting, getting there. 1 Corinthians 12. Let me make sure that's what I was supposed to do. For the edifying of the body of Christ, in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 12, 5, it says, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are ministries that are in this city. My gracious, you can't swing a cat without hitting another ministry in this town. And I love my cats. I don't swing them on purpose. I just kind of, okay? Because I'm deathly allergic to them unless the Lord has healed me. I haven't been around a cat lately. But, you know, the ministry in this city, there's diversities of ministry. Man, you can't go around without bumping into one, which is good. We need that kind of safety net in our city. There are desperately hungry people out there. Verse 13 says, till we all come to the unity of faith. Ooh, ow. What does that look like? Unity of the faith. Unity of the faith. Does that look like the mind of Christ functioning fully in the church? I think so. If we're all the body of Christ working together as one body, then perhaps our character and our influence may carry more weight. The division in the body has been devastating. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that is full growth. The full maturity of Christ, that is full grown, full grown church, folks. We've got a little ways to go, just a little ways. <laughs> Why do we want to get into the full stature or the fullness of Christ? We need the fullness of him. Verse 14 says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the ooh trickery of men. We talked about some of that Sunday, about the world system. How conniving and de devious, deceiving it is. In the cunning craftiness, oh, there's that word, of deceitful plotting. We have to be full stature so that we don't get hoodwinked by the enemy. Because he is not about to give ground. And as the, the move of God in a city impacts it, He's going to infiltrate. And when the five-fold ministry forgets that they are a gift, they play right into the hands of the enemy. Because people love structure. They do. They find safety in it. Not only do people like to be under structure, there are those that have that gifting and calling of, an, of the five-fold ministry that like to see structure. But as soon as humility is removed from the equation, the enemy goes, I got him. Because then we are speaking his language, I will ascend on high. I will do this. See, this is why this is such dangerous ground. We've seen it so many times fumble and stumble, but God has not given up on it. Amen? 
It is still in his design to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to edify the body. Amen? I'm going to get my stool. I wish this place was so full you couldn't turn around, and it will be in Jesus' name, because this is a critical teaching and understanding for our town, for the times that we live in. God is the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Those are all framework of the reality we walk in. Apostolic leaders begin with the future, then look to the present. I'm going to say that again. Apostolic leaders begin with the future, then look to the present. There's a, an ability in an apostolic ministry that they go into the heavenly realms. An apostolic, you've got the fivefold working, okay? The prophet, they can see, they understand, they get the vision for what's coming. The apostle has the authority to dictate and establish. They work hand in hand, the apostles and the prophets, because they draw from what God's future vision is and they bring it here and birth it here through the authority that's on them. The evangelist catches the vision and it spreads what's going on contagiously like a virus, which, but it's a good thing. The pastors come in and they shepherd those that are being brought in and the teachers rise them up and train their hands for war with the giftings that they carry. That's the, the beauty of the function of the fivefold as a gift to the church, as a gift not to be forgotten. Those who focus on the past, for the most part, are reactive. It's wonderful to study how the past moves of God worked. But you know what? They're past. They're past moves. Behold, I do a what? New thing. That's where we want to be, on the cutting edge of what he's doing in the moment. We don't want to be reactive. We want to be the ones that dictate and establish and start and birth the next thing coming. Those that look to the past, are read, they readily see obstacles, and they have a low tolerance of risk. We've all been around ministries like that. Man, I thought I was going to lose my mind when I was around those kind of people. Being the way I'm wired, I was always looking out there and going, okay, how am I going to get that here? As I've said many times, what's happening right now in this church, I wasn't planning on seeing until three more years. God's going, wow, my time. I said, good, your time's better than my time any day. And that's why we're doing this now, because I wasn't planning on doing this for a while. Everything has been sped up on me, and that's fine. I love God's timing. He's good that way. I'm not looking back and being reactive. I'm not low, I don't have a, a low tolerance for risk. Good gravy, if I had a low tolerance of risk, I would have packed up a long time ago. You know, God's taking us from walking, you know, being in the boat to walking on the water. Pretty soon he's going to start demanding that we walk in thin air. That's going to twist your head off. That's exactly. We'll be just going, pff. we got this water thing figured out. He's going, okay. Then he's going to say, you remember how I ascended? Come on, let's go for a walk. There's an apostolic word for you that's going to really get your britches on fire. Those who choose to focus on the future are more likely to be proactive. They readily see opportunities, and they have a high tolerance of risk. That makes most people just scream and meme scared. You know, we, we came into this place. We pressed in. We were in the gym. We pressed the Lord, and the Lord started stirring that thing. Okay, it's time to start to find a building. I'm like, okay, man. And we looked at a building. That nah, didn't work. Looked at a couple other places. Man, we just kept running into walls. We knew we had to fi have that $5,000 if we had to move into a place there hadn't been a church. We had no clue what was going on. We went into the city council, and we met with the people there, the building inspectors and stuff, and then one guy who was a Christian felt the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I believe. He doesn't say that. He probably wouldn't confess it. He said, why don't you go over here and check out this building? 
He said another church was over there, and it didn't, wasn't going to work for him. I said, oh, fine. So, I mean, immediately, in the moment, I went, I, zippity-doo-dah, I drove right over here. And I drove in here, and, you know, I was at Randy, one of the Randy's conferences with uh, uh, Paul Keith Davis and Bobby Connors, and, it, and this time I was there, but this building didn't look anything like it is now. There was just one wall. It wasn't the big U. So I waited, and, and the, the guy that does the leasing of the building came in, and, and I walked in, and I came through the door. I was like, oh, man, I know that spirit. I felt it. I've been around Randy enough. I knew him, and I knew what was with him. And I felt it in here, and I went, I know that taste. I know that smell. I said, you know, years ago, a friend of mine, Randy DeMaine, had a church. Was it anywhere around here? He says, you're standing in the space he was in. I went, oh, yeah. Still, it makes my hair stand up. <laughs> my God led me to this place for the benefit of all of my family here. Not only did he do that, but at, from just even tonight, people have made mention of the cor correlation of what we've just done physically to this building and what it used to be like when Randy was here. That I find very interesting as well. And you, we see the establishment of the Cornerstone Training Center next door. We've been stepping into that. We've been seeing powerful things happening on Sunday afternoons. So that's a, a reestablishing of things. So, you know, we're walking and we're moving in him. In him we live and move and have our being. That's where we stop trying to be, and we are. We just are. John Maxwell says, losers yearn for the past and get stuck in it. Losers yearn for the past and get stuck in it. Man, I've been there. You know why? Because I always, it was just like Moses and all those Israelites I was remembering all them wonderful onions and stuff we had in Egypt. It's better than being out here in a desert. Because I yearned for the past because I'd lost the vision of where we were going. That was years ago. God restructured me. Really set my ability to press into vision. And I've never looked back. And those that have been around me long enough know you better get in, sit down, shut up, and hang on because we're moving by God's grace. Winners learn from the past and let go of it. That's why I'm, this is all building for the apostolic because we have to understand this shift that's coming. I'll tell you a little story because it, I think it makes sense. I have a really nice car that my mother-in-law, when she passed away, I inherited. It's got a lot of power. When you talk about shift, it's what I want you to kind of get a feel for. That car has more power than I dare give anybody but me. My children... Andrea can drive it. She knows how to drive that thing. Nathaniel drove it after the wedding. He's like, I, I was real careful. I drove real slow. I looked like grandma driving that car. I said, good. But there was a day, several times, I'll put it several times because I'll be honest, but the most recent one is I was coming back from the coast, beautiful day on the coast, come up over CDM Pass, and there was two boats in front of me. I went, I'm tired of looking at propellers. So I just, you know, I had the music going, and Patty's on her computer not paying attention. I'm like, yeah, baby. <laughs> so I, and it was dark, so I knew I could see on a long downhill grade coming down there past the old burnout. Okay, you know where I'm at? Right there? So I just went about halfway down. Whoa! And we're just, we just, whoosh, whoosh, and I went, man, I look in the mirrors. I'm like, where'd, those come, where'd the boats go? And I see pin lights way back there. I'm like, and suddenly I realize there's a lot of noise in the cabin. And I'm like, I'm not used to that kind of noise in here. The radio was playing. I still heard this noise. So I looked down the speedometer. I went, wow, there's only 20 more miles per hour on this thing before it tops out of the top needle. 
And then instantly I went, oh, my goodness. Took my foot off. That's the kind of shift I'm talking about, going from, from 55 to high rate of speed in about three seconds. This is what the apostolic shift is going to be like. You're going to have a lot of noise in the cabin. And that car smooth as glass going fast. That's why it's called the Champagne Rocket. It's the name for my car. Okay? Imagine the speed of Christ moving his church at the speed of his thought. That is the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ. That is my desire. That is his heart. And that is what I am praying is birthed in this city. The faith found in Hebrews 11 is for the future. Remember the Hebrew Hall of Fame, chapter 11? That is faith by faith. So-and-so did this. By faith, by faith, by faith. That is the kind of faith we need to have built in us to step into the things that are laid before us. That is the momentum of heaven. Faith carries it. We put apostolic feet to prophetic insight. We put apostolic feet to prophetic insight. That is substance to faith. Apostolic feet to prophetic insight. That's, a, that's something that goes in the refrigerator to chew on. That is how the apostle and the prophet work together. The prophet sees it, speaks it. The apostle goes, I got it. And he steps in and empowers it, and it happens. Ed Delf, quote from him, says, Most of them feel that they are called to take ground but not hold ground. That's an apostle. Most apostles feel that they're just called to go take ground, but they don't hold it. Because you know why? They're going to the next goal. They're shooting for the next place. They're going, okay, guys, I took it, take it, build it, establish it, I'm going on. Now, I'm going to tell you something about the pioneering spirit. It's almost apostolic if it stays under God. It is apostolic. Let me get that fly. That's it. I'll just speak death to it. It'll drop to the floor. Could I say that statement again? What did I just say? Oh, okay. The pioneering spirit that we always hear about. Okay, if it's underneath the ungodly, without God, the Holy Spirit directing it, it is ungodly. Because it'll take you and it'll make you a rogue. But underneath... The godly influence of the Holy Spirit, it is a truly pure apostolic movement. That's why when I see people have a pioneering spirit, I can say, you know what? That's redeemable in them. If they will bring themselves under the correction of the Holy Spirit and direction and ministry and the love and correction of a body. But a rogue by themselves are dangerous. That's why the pioneering spirit has gotten such a bad rap. I don't want to get too far into that one because I'll just go on a heyday on that because I've been there. In my early days, I studied the wolf. I knew everything about a wolf. I could read them. I went to Cleveland to see the wolves in the exhibits. I studied, I read, I understood their culture because there's a true culture to a wolf. And then I realized that most people get terrified of wolves, but within the society of the wolf pack, there's beautiful leadership and reproduction and training up of the next generation, but they can be terrifying. Same holds true with the apostolic. If they're done properly, it's a beautiful thing. If it's one iota off-center, it's a terrifying thing. But I'm not afraid of something that Christ gave as a gift. 
I pray for the humbling of the fivefold ministry to work as the gift it was sent to be. John Richardson says, when it comes to the future, there are three kinds of people. When it comes to the future, there are three kinds of people. Those who let it happen, those who make it happen, and then there are those that just wondered what happened. I want to be underneath the guidance of the Holy Spirit because his word says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. My steps are laid before me, and my Savior and Lord is leading me. The blessings of God are upon me and overtaking me, and I am making it happen under the anointing and protection and provision of the Holy Spirit and God's gifting and call upon my life. It is not of the power within me. It is within the empowerment of Christ as I am seated in him. That's where the fivefold ministry of the apostolic movement must remain, must find its true identity. George Barna. Vision is entrusted to an individual. That's very true. Vision is entrusted to an individual. Did you notice in the Bible that God never gave vision to a committee? What happens to committee? He gets stuck in committee. Look at the democratic process. My gracious, they're running around like knuckleheads trying to figure out what they're going to do about this crisis. And then another one's over here, and they went, we don't want to look at that one. Let's keep looking at this one. Let's stay stuck in committee. In every case, God selected a person for whom he tailored a vision for a better future. We have laid before us a hand-designed future for us. Every single one of us in this room. Every single one of us. There's not one of us that has been disqualified, no matter what age, for a better future. When does it start? Now. Whoop. Now. Whoop. Now. Every second it is in being engaged in your life. It is not a point where you go, there it was, it's gone. No. A better future is now, 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 now. It is existed and released and experienced in the moment. I'm going to give you nine specific things about individual leaders. Are you ready? I'll go slow. When individual leaders have freedom from permission withholders, I'm going to say this real slow so you can get this, because this is really important for you to get inside you. This is your DNA. When individual leaders have freedom from permission holders, permission holders are those guys with the reins going, whoa, slow down. They're usually the committee. Understand? They're the ones that grab you by the beard hair and pulls you around because they think you're moving too quick. When individual leaders have freedom for permission hold withholders, they can be as creative as God wants them to be. Amen. Amen. They can be as creative as God wants them to be. I like that. That means that when I am in my dad's hands, his, the fullness of his inspiration will come out of me and it will come out of you. Doesn't that make you salivate for that? When the naysayers are released from you, and the full creative power and genius and ingenuity of God, Daddy God, releases through you. There, that is going from the boat to the water to walking on thin air. That's what I crave. If that scares you, God bless you. God will change your mind. He will. Because he, it has not entered the mind 
the heart of what God desires his best for you. You haven't even thought of it because his ways are better and higher than our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We haven't obtained the mind of Christ enough yet to even think like Christ. But you know what? It doesn't mean we can't pursue it. It's there for us. It is a mystery for us to crack into and open and do it in humility, pursuing and asking and laying at his feet and spending time with him. All right, number one, there's nine of these about individual leaders and being creative. They can take risks. Almost got him. I did have him. Sorry about that. They can take risks. When individuals, leaders, are set free from the naysayers, they can take risks. Does that mean that they do it out of stupidity? No. Good gravy, no. They've got to be tied into the Holy Spirit. They have to have done everything they can to press in as deep as possible to be rooted and grounded in the Word and rooted and grounded in the Spirit. Those two have to be hand in hand. You get this spiritual people, and they, without the Word, they float away. Bye. You get them rooted in the Word, they're down there like moles, digging deep, digging deep, digging deep. They have no vision for higher places. They're digging deep. I'm rooted in, man. I ain't moving. You get the two of them working together, and then they, they go here, and they ascend. Then they come down and bring blessing. They go up and ascend. They come down and bring blessing. They take risks. Number two, they can make mistakes. Oh, hallelujah, we're allowed to make a mistake once in a while. Why? Because I learn from my mistakes. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm working on the mind of Christ. I'm learning how to hear his voice precisely. I'm learning how to be in season and out of season. So you know what? I'm going to make mistakes. I'm the first one to tell you. You've heard me so many times as a pastor in here saying, you know what? I still mess my diaper once in a while. But you know what? Happens a lot less. Thank goodness. He is bringing the image of Christ within us as individuals. So you know what? Mistakes happen. I would just as soon have a full barn and a lot of mess to clean up than nothing in the barn and nice and tidy. Because if it's nice and tidy and no life in there, it's just a barn with no life, no sustenance, no reproductant, no blessing. Number three, individual leaders, when they're free from with, uh, permission withholders, they can explore new territory. This fun. I love doing things with the Holy Spirit. When God takes me for a walk, when, he, when I get to those times where I get to the doorways and, and I ask if I can look and see, and he goes, yes. And you know what? I don't mind it when he says, no, you can't look today because that means I'm not ready yet. But you know what? It means that I'm still inquisitive and having that sanctified pioneering spirit I'm going to go looking because I'm looking for some place that hasn't been evangelized. It hasn't had the touch of God yet. That's just the way I'm wired. Because you know what? I am a vessel that can only contain so much, and i got to get it out before it gets stagnant because I want more. So I explore new territories. Number four, and I like this. This will bust up some religious thinking. They can color outside the lines. Oh, woo! Coloring outside the lines. You know why I like that? Because when there's lines and God allows me to color outside of them, I get his inspiration and creativity to go outside of the black and white. What man has formed, the black and white, and God wants to go color Ectochrome, Kodachrome, all the color stuff. God is a God of color. Look at his creation. So color outside the lines. They can push back boundaries. I like that. Who sets boundaries? God does. But who twists boundaries to limit us? The enemy 
in our maturing process, we set boundaries for ourselves, and the things that we place upon ourselves limit us as well. In the natural, I had to get new clothes a lot because I was a growing kid. When I was 12 years old, I grew six inches in one summer. My mother about went broke buying me clothes. I went to five foot 11 at 12 years old. I was the biggest kid that ever come out of my hometown. They couldn't even find a baseball uniform for me. I played my, my regular clothes. I had to take my birth certificate to show people I was 12. Because when I walked on the field, they said, that kid's too old. Five foot 11 at 12 years old, that's a big kid. I had little kids that were this tall that would run away from me when I'd run the bases. I had no problem stealing a base because they'd run out of the way. I could throw from the center field to home play without a bounce. I was the best center fielder and pitcher this team ever had. We were undefeated. We beat one team like 38 to 6. I had five home runs. Cleared the bases. I was big. I was about taking territory. I pushed boundaries. That was just natural. Now I'm spiritually that big. I'm bigger than you see me. Because God's building a great man, and he's doing the same in you. He's building great men and women of God to carry his ministry. And he set me as a point man in this house. And I believe in this city, and I believe there's also regional things that God has not revealed to me yet that I am here for. And what we're doing tonight is I'm speaking into this realm, into this area, into this region, into this territory, that it better get ready because the apostolic's being released here. And I have a part to play, and there's many others that are coming along as well. And I am not scared because I know who's with me, and I know who's commissioned me, and I know what he's said to do, and I will do exactly what he says to do, and I will do nothing more. But I push boundaries. Number six, they can butcher sacred cows. They can butcher sacred cows. I learned how to take care of animals at a very young age, and I know how to do it in the spiritual realm as well. The natural mirrors the spiritual, and we know how to kick over sacred cows and then finish the job because sacred cows keep you in bondage. They limit your stretching ability. They keep you in a restricted area. Sacred cows are worth nothing, and they stink. They're already dead. You just haven't figured that out yet. Number seven, they can shake up the status quo. That's like killing sacred cows, man. We shake up the status quo. Why? Because we're visionaries. We go places. We push boundaries. We break rules. We bust stuff up. We take risks. We make mistakes, but God cleans it up. He's guiding us. We're pressing into the things. We're setting up the new normal. The new normal. Boy, I'd love to speak on that one. I just got two more to do. They can break rules. Amen. Rules are normally made by man. Well, you can't do that. Says who? Even when that lady came to Jesus, who was a Samaritan, my daughter's afflicted by demons. Well, I don't want, I'm just for the children of Israel. But even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. Ah, I can answer that one. That was a boundary and a rule that, got, that she was able to break because she had the right verbiage and she knew how to attach to truth. Be it done unto you. And she was delivered even though she wasn't an, an Israelite. I was sent to the house of Israel. But you know what? You got the key to unlock that rule, and you bypassed it, and it's broken. Individual leaders, when they have freedom from permission withholders, and I love this one, they can soar to new heights. Yeah, amen is right. Amen is right. You bust status quos, 
you kill sacred cows and butcher them. You bust boundaries. You go outside the lines. You take new territory. You make mistakes. You take the risks. You break the rules because you have a, a new height that you soar to. You, we are seated in Christ where? In the heavenly places. You soar there. He renews your strength like the eagle. Our designed placement is in Christ in the heavenly realms. But we have been given dominion here upon the earth to fulfill the call that was given to Adam to come and subdue and to bring his reign and rule back upon this earth, to release his kingdom and advance it. What will undermine the new leaders and the new breed is permission withholders. And what they will use, the permission withholders will use these two things. They will use suspicion and distrust as their weapons. And they're like ninjas with those two. They sow distrust amongst the brethren and they feed it with suspicion. And they attack the fivefold ministry under the direction of of the doctrine of demons. Trust and empowerment. Trust and empowerment by those that are being birthed into this apostolic movement will shape the future. Not in the individual. Not in me. Not in the fivefold ministry. Because we will make mistakes. We may hurt you. That is not our plan. Our function is to be a gift, a good gift. Every good gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. That is the gift of the fivefold ministry. That is every good and perfect gift. Because within the fivefold ministry and the training and the equipping that the saints go into, they then find the truth of Christ and their identity and they walk in kingdom realities. That's where the good gifts show up and manifest in your life. That is the true heart and purpose of the apostolic movement. Not so far that I've seen manifested. But that is our purpose, and we will find purpose refined and fine-tuned as we press the Holy Spirit to do a work of circumcision on our hearts in the fivefold ministry. I got about three more minutes. So suspicion and distrust feed the status quo. Trust and empowerment shapes the future, and the new apostolic release. Trust is the root, and authority is the fruit. In the new apostolic release, trust is the root. We trust in Christ. We grow deep into him. And authority is what we bear as fruit. And it is only as we draw upon him that we will bear fruit that remains Are you still getting hit? Am I still hitting you right here? Okay, good. Because if I start shooting over to the back row, let me know. Just wave me off, and I'll slow down, and I'll come back around, and we'll do another pass. Because this is critical. I am speaking to the principalities and powers in this region of what is coming to visit. Didn't mean to get stirred up, but this stuff stirs me up. This is placed in the point man and not a board. It is put, it is placed in the point man or the set man in those positions of the fivefold as a gift 
and not a board of directors. We stand on the precipice of one of the most powerful releases of the kingdom of God that this earth has seen since the days Christ and the apostles walked this earth. The restoration of all things is upon us. We've got to get our eyes open and our spirit in agreement, start pressing, start pressing, start pushing the borders. God has set a calling over this house to do a part of what is being released in this city. Not only in the city, in the body of Christ in, the, in Redmond, the church of Redmond, and in this region and territory. He has set up specific churches that I know, and I've released and I see them, that there is a line of flow. And you've heard me speak it before. I know, where, I, I know within about 40 miles both ways of who these churches are that God's releasing. Haven't seen how they're going to come together. Don't know all that impacting yet. But I know that there's something, there's like a, it's like the Underground Railroad. It's like the forts that were built back where I come from along the major rivers and thoroughfares. Down along the uh, Allegheny and the, down through Pittsburgh, there, were, there was Fort LaBeouf and all these other, Fort Erie, Fort, I mean, there was a whole line of forts that were set up. And they were f- along the waterways, that was the, where the traveling happened. God has set churches along the 97 corridor. They're strategically set there for the flow and the transference and the transportation of what the kingdom of God is going to do to this area. We will not miss our timing. In Jesus' name, I speak that out because I'm not afraid to say it. I've seen it in the past where the flyby came in, the touchdown was there, and nobody engaged. Tragic. Did not sway God in any way. God knows, but he's letting us have opportunities as he drives by, as he flies by and goes, are you ready yet? And we muster. You've heard earlier this summer I was talking about a mustering for the engaging or the engagement. God is gathering, and he showed me the big throw switch on those old tractors that engaged the clutch that ran those big old belts that ran the buzz saw blades. And he is mustering a group of people to engage his kingdom, to release the power of his kingdom in this area that will buzz saw through the things that the enemy has set here Because we are carrying out his commissioning that he was sent here to destroy the works of the enemy and we are also carrying that same mandate upon our lives. And we come in, we displace the enemy. He flees as the light of the light lifestyle is released in us. And then we come in and tear up all the structure and the stuff that he has built because if you don't tear it up, he'll come back in the back door and re-inhabit it. So you pulverize it through prayer an intercession and release of revelation from God to disrupt and uproot and tear down those things the enemy has built. And then you reestablish and rebuild the walls. The restoration is upon us, folks. The rebuilding of the walls. Isaiah 61. Are you ready for the task that God has set before you? Are you ready for the release of his creativity to flow through you? Now is the time. Now is the time. He hovers upon us to breathe upon us, to inspire us, and he calls to us. And he releases identity and inspiration of his spirit inside of us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this evening. 
And Lord, I ask that you take the words that were spoken tonight and drive them deep and root them inside of you as individuals, that they would be rooted deeply in you, Lord Jesus, that the authority, the correct authority of Christ would be the fruit that is grown upon this area and upon those that you've called and raised up. Lord, we thank you for that gift of the fivefold ministry. And we ask that you nurture their hearts, that they will walk in humility, that they will recognize that they are a gift, and that they are a usable gift, and that they are to be sacrificing their lives for the equipping of the saints, for the edification of the body of Christ, till they all come together into the full stature and maturity of the image of Christ that your name would be glorified. In Jesus' precious name, amen.